Hello um, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Krishni Waring and I'm Chair of Northamptonshire Healthcare um, and I wanted to welcome you all today to our um, what we hope will be one of a series of members events um, for um, NHFT members and people, um, general members of the public and our stakeholders. So really, really delighted that so many of you have joined us today. We think at the moment we've got about 50 people online with us, uh, but we did have quite a large number registered originally. Um, so looking forward to people joining the event uh, as we go on. The event is being recorded, um, so it'll be available to view uh, for people who haven't been able to um, access it live. So in effect, it'll be on catch up, I think is the correct uh, technical term. Um, I mentioned that it's a members event uh, and just to explain that uh, members are people who've registered with us uh, as people who are interested in finding out more about our services and what we're doing and being a member with us allows you to have early um, access to information about events and you get um, newsletters and, and other, other such items of interest. Um, you also get an opportunity to participate in these events and potentially stand as a governor and um, elect governors to our council. So we'll come back to what being a member is, um, is the benefits of being a member at the end, because uh, I'd just like to remind everybody uh, of the opportunities that that presents when we uh, conclude this event. So the event today is all about maintaining your mental health and well-being. And this time of year is probably you know, mental health is a topic all year round. It's really important that we look after our mental health and well-being. However, I think um, this particular time of year, um, sometimes people call it Blue Monday because there's a suggestion that post Christmas with the bills coming in and the, the winter blues, um, people feel perhaps um, less well mentally um, than they would normally. So um, it's important to recognise mental health is all year round, but just marking today, particularly with this event, we thought would be a really good opportunity to help people think about the ways in which you can look after your own mental health and also the services, the range of services that are accessible to people um, and that uh, people can take advantage of uh, to, to help them. Um, and actually, you know, during this coronavirus pandemic, Clearly, there's been lots of um, discussion about the effect of that on our mental health. So in many ways, there is no time uh, better than now to really talk about mental health and bring it into everybody's focus. Um, what I do want to say is if anyone's feeling particularly unwell today in terms of mental health, um, please feel free to um, post um, uh, a question on our Q&A. Richard will shortly explain what that involves uh, and we can try and direct you to um, the appropriate services. We've got a great agenda. Nikki, can you bring up um, the slide please on our agenda? So we've got a great agenda um, that we're going to be taking you through. Um, so, as I said, I'm chair of NHFT and I'm just really here to welcome you and introduce you to um, the event that we've got planned for you. But I'm really delighted to say that we've also got our medical director, uh, Dr. Itai Matumbike, who's also a consultant forensic psychiatrist. And Itai will be talking about uh, both, I think, his experience as a consultant psychiatrist but also his personal reflections on mental health. Um, also today we have Chris Davison, our um, public governor for Kettering and Corby and our acting lead governor um, uh, sharing his perspectives. And then uh, as the session wears on, we've got um, people from our Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Service, which is otherwise known as IAPT, or you might hear it uh, referred to as Changing Minds. So Dr. Sarah Clare, Nathan Clues, 
um, uh, we'll be talking about the service and how it can help people and how you can refer yourself to it or if or others can refer themselves. Um, and then finally, we have Dr. David Smart. David is a GP, a uh, local GP and clinical director for mental health and prevention for the North Hants GP Alliance. So I'm um, really delighted that all those people have uh, agreed to take part in our event today. And you'll see on the agenda, there's plenty of opportunity for questions and answers. Um, and as I said, Richard will shortly explain uh, the, the way in which uh, we can actually do that. We do have a short break at the midway point, uh, excuse me, at 3.10, um, so there'll be an opportunity for people to stretch their legs and, and grab a cup of tea, uh, but do come back and join us so that you don't miss out on these fantastic presentations from so many colleagues. Um, I think that probably covers everything that I want to say now, so I'm going to hand over to Richard, um, who uh, is going to come in just really to explain how you can, uh, how we're going to evaluate the event and how you can ask any questions. So over to you, Richard. Thanks very much, uh, Krishni. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's uh, Richard. I work for uh, Corporate Affairs here uh, at NHFT. Um, and it's really exciting actually to be at the uh, outset of our first ever mm. virtual uh, members event. Um, it's been quite some time since we actually ran uh, a members event. The last one that I did was certainly a face-to-face -face, uh, event. And although um, in some ways it feels um, a bit strange actually doing an event via Microsoft uh, Teams. We certainly had a reasonably positive experience of using Teams and got some good feedback from our annual general meeting and our annual public and members meeting earlier this year. So uh, um, as Chris has already articulated, we've got a number of different speakers um, this afternoon. One of the limitations of the platform given that we've got, I think, 170 people that uh, are participating this afternoon, is that we can't see and hear everybody on our screens. So the main method of communicating with us, if you've got a comment or a question that you wish to pose about the presentations this afternoon, is using the chat function uh, on your computer. So you should find a, a Q&A function where you can type in uh, a question to us. Um, it will come through to um, a few of us that are moderating questions. So if you've got a, a technical issue or if you've got a, a concern, as, as Krishni mentioned, you can communicate with us through this function privately. And if it's something then that, that should be published to the wider group, um, we will do so. Uh, similarly, if it's a question that you wish to pose, we'll of course um, publish that um, a, as well. So do use the chat function to, to pose a question or to make a comment and we'll pick that up uh, and respond um, accordingly. So another mechanism that we've got um, this afternoon and those that participated in the uh, annual public and members meeting will be familiar with this technology is a piece of software called Slido. So uh, I can see that the slide has uh, just emerged uh, now. So Slido is essentially an online polling um, piece of technology uh, which enables you to um, essentially respond anonymously um, to some questions that, that we are posing. And you can see a strange symbol uh, on your screen, which I believe is called a QR code. Um, if you hold your uh, phone camera, if you've got a, a smartphone and you've got the capability, you can use that as a quick link um, through um, to the Slido platform where you can then essentially respond to the prompt um, there. Um, and you will then need to use the, uh, the code hashtag blue monday nhft um, so i'm going to ask um, my colleague uh, tracy just to type in the web address um, for slido into the q a function for those that don't have a smartphone um, that would need to access slido via the web browser you can follow the link um, via the the web browser and again you'll need to tap in the code um, hash blue monday nhft to load up slido so um, I think if we can go on to the next slide, um, please, uh, Nikki, we should be able to then test um, whether people can um, use Slido. So this is simply a question as at now. Um, how much do you know about accessing mental health services here in Northamptonshire? So essentially, we're just asking you to respond to the prompt using the numbers one to five. Um, actually, one, I don't know a great deal about how to access mental health services or five. I'm very familiar with accessing mental health services. 
So if, you, if I could ask you either using your smartphone and the QR code on the screen or by typing in the Slido address and using hash Blue Monday NHFT to put your uh, response into the question um, and we will see in a minute or so's time um, what the results are looking like. OK, so whilst we're waiting for that, I can see um, a few questions that have been coming in. So yes, hopefully those people that um, uh, were uh, greeted with a blank screen um, can now see and hear what's what's going on now that we've started the, the live event. Apologies for a slightly delayed uh, start. We were just making sure we've got uh, everybody uh, logged logged in. OK, so I don't know, Nikki, if we can switch to the Slido um, results screen to see if we've got some results that are coming in. Um, and they do always say don't, don't with, work with um, technology uh, or, or with uh, animals, don't they? So we'll have to see <laughs> if the technology is working. If it isn't, we'll have to use the uh, the chat function for the rest uh, of the of the meeting. OK, ah, excellent. So we've had some responses through here and I believe that uh, as more responses come in, um, we'll see the, uh, the slider um, increase, which it's doing as we speak. Brilliant. Um, OK, so it, it looks as though we've got a good range of responses coming in. So some people that are very familiar with accessing uh, mental health services and some that actually know less about um, NHFT service. That's um, really helpful to know. So as Krishni mentioned when talking through the agenda, um, particularly in relation to IAPS and certainly some of the um, contributions from uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smart later on. Um, we'll hope, hopefully shift the, shift the uh, responses to more people knowing more about how to access services. Um, so we'll come back to that um, particular poll um, at the end. It's worth saying before I hand over to, uh, to the first uh, presenter, you can continue to respond to the poll um, as we're talking. So if you are having difficulties moving into Slido and want to participate in the poll, don't worry, it hasn't disappeared. You will still be able to uh, access it um, as we push on with the next presentation. OK, so hopefully that's clarified. There are two methods of, of communicating with us. Um, if we ask you a particular question via the Slido platform, please use Slido and we'll signal when we need to be using Slido. But throughout the presentations and the session today, please do use the question and answer function um, and we will respond to you via that mechanism. OK, so I think that's enough um, from me. Um, I will hand over now to our first uh, presenter, um, who is our medical director, Itai. But before I do so, I'll just hand back to Krishni to do a, uh, a welcome. Thanks, Krishni. Thanks, Richard. Um, I really just wanted to say how delighted we are again to have our medical director um, starting us off with these presentations. Um, Itai, I'm sure he'll correct me now, but he, he joined us um, back at back end of last year. So he's still relatively new to our organisation. I think we've decided it's newish and we don't know how long we can carry on describing him as newish, but I'm really, really delighted that he's been able to make time despite some pretty um, challenging pressures at the moment operationally to join us here today um, and to talk about his perspectives um, as medical director and as I said as a consultant psychiatrist so um, really delighted um, Itai to hand over to you thank you uh, thank you Thank you very much, uh, Krishni, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, and I'm also glad to hear that my newbie status has not been completely revoked. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm really proud to be the medical director of uh, NHFT. Um, I'm a consultant uh, forensic psychiatrist, and uh, for me, mental health, um, you know, it touches not just my professional uh, but also my personal life. I'm delighted to be presenting today with uh, Chris Davidson, who's uh, public governor for Kettering and Corby and uh, our acting lead governor. Um, and uh, as I said uh, before, uh, I, I, I will take the next 10 minutes talking about mental health uh, from the different perspectives that I have um, as medical director, as a consultant psychiatrist, uh, as a colleague uh, for uh, NHS, um, uh, you know, uh, employers uh, and employees. Uh, and also as um, as a carer uh, for someone with a severe and uh, enduring mental illness uh, who is very close to me. 
Um, we've uh, come together today as um, uh, the third Monday of January, which is uh, traditionally seen as the lowest day of the year with dark nights. Um, and, and like Krishna said earlier, bills start arriving uh, and uh, people are still finding a way to uh, to go uh, before uh, payday. Um, uh, around Christmas time, I, I speak for myself, I love to cook um, and it's a really happy time. The, you know, the four uh, the, the day, the advent to Christmas is uh, is really exciting. Looking forward to presents. Looking forward to um, you know being around family. Um, and uh, it's the aftermath of Christmas uh, where um, you know the reality of our situation sort of start to take um, you know to take hold. Uh, that we start to feel a little bit low. Uh, and this combined with you know uh, inability to access uh, open spaces outside. Um, and we start to feel uh, sort of really low and we can, uh, you know, we, we can say that we have good and bad days in mental health um, and a, quite a large proportion of us at around about this time, um, you know, start to feel uh, the pressures uh, of the lives around us. Um, I believe that, um, you know, uh, poor mental health is one of uh, the greatest public um, uh, challenges facing our organisation. Um, any opportunity to shine a spotlight on it um, you know, and discuss our mental health problems um, uh, is always something that I'm keen to support. Uh, from my perspective as um, a medical director of this uh, esteemed organisation, I'm delighted to see us uh, showcasing uh, our uh, IAP service and talking about how we're going to respond to uh, the COVID pandemic. I'm also delighted to see our primary care colleagues such as uh, uh, Dr. David Smart, um, you know, talking about the support available. Uh, to um, uh, people in the community in that space. At NHFT, we are really ambitious um, uh, to achieve the best possible uh, outcomes for our people. Uh, and we do some great work um, with the police, with ambulance services, um, and with uh, third sector people uh, in crisis. We're also working in partnership with um, other uh, providers uh, in the East Midlands um, uh, to better understand um, our services and uh, and how we can meet the demand um, that we're faced with. By working together with colleagues and partners, uh, we can better help those who need our services and break down the stigma uh, which is associated uh, with mental illness. As a consultant psychiatrist, um, I know that talking about and asking for help uh, is always you know, the hardest first step. Um, and it's perhaps more uh, than any other year in recent memory, uh, it's particularly with um, with a pandemic um, which has uh, really wreaked havoc in uh, every facet of our lives. Um, we have uh, tended to lose our sort of social connectedness um, uh, as a population. We've um, to face some really difficult uh, financial challenges uh, with uh, businesses not being able to operate in the usual way that they've been able to. Uh, and with lockdown, uh, people have felt really, really isolated and this has contributed to low mood and anxiety. Um, other uh, things that we see in mental health, uh, particularly in my line of work as a, uh, as a low secure forensic psychiatrist, is the exacerbation of some of the psychotic disorders, uh, increasing paranoia, uh, amongst some of our patients uh, due to uh, the prevailing uh, pandemic uh, is, is a particular challenge uh, for services at the current time. And there are also um, other, uh, you know, uh, the service users who will uh, struggle to come to terms with, um, you know, things such as social distancing, people with intellectual di uh, disabilities, uh, people uh, with cognitive uh, uh, difficulties such as uh, dementia, find it particularly challenging uh, to come to terms with um, the things that we have. All of this, you know, puts uh, quite a lot of pressure uh, on, uh, on our staff uh, and what uh, our staff are uh, experiencing um, is quite unprecedented. Uh, now more than ever, we uh, need to look at mental health from uh, both a physical and emotional uh, well-being perspective. Uh, and I'm very committed um, as an individual uh, to uh, seeing that through. At NHFT, we have a range uh, of support available uh, from conversations with our psychologists and the lunchtime uh, meditation and yoga 
um, and I've personally uh, accessed um, uh, Sunil Ladd's uh, sessions uh, on Microsoft Teams and found those to be particularly helpful in sort of breaking down, uh, breaking up the day and just giving myself that space uh, to be mindful uh, and improve my well-being. I'd recommend uh, such sessions to, uh, to anyone who uh, has got um, an, an opportunity to access them. As a carer, uh, as I said, um, of someone who's very close to me, who has a severe and enduring mental illness, uh, I understand the impact uh, that um, a number of people who are uh, in the audience um, uh, will probably have if they're carers as well. I understand uh, that it's vital uh, to seek help uh, and uh, to access the support that we need uh, from em an emotional, physical uh, and mental wellness perspective. I'm really pleased uh, that uh, to see today's presentations are um, a full of practical support, which is really what we need and which is what we need to be focusing on. Before I hand over to Chris, I want to reflect uh, that uh, perhaps an important purpose of Blue Monday uh, is to remember that we all have uh, mental health um, and uh, that there are steps that we can take on every day uh, of the year uh, to try and protect it. Uh, depression and other uh, mental problems last for more than just one day uh, and mental health problems can affect people in different ways um, uh, on any day of the year. Uh, so I urge you to uh, talk about your feelings uh, with someone you know and trust. But try to keep active, eat well, uh, drink sensibly, ask for help if you're struggling. At a time um, of the pandemic, you know, trying to anticipate distress and staying connected and engaging uh, in a new a rhythm of life is important. So think about your mental health today uh, and uh, on every day of the year. So um, I will uh, hand over to Chris at this time. Thank you very much for listening. Well, hello, good, af good afternoon, everyone. Uh, normally we say at this sort of stage, it's nice to see you all, but it's very difficult, isn't it, through a screen to connect with everyone. But I'm delighted that those of you who have joined as Krishni says, to what will be hopefully a programme of events aimed at members and the public we serve, as we look to signpost you to resources that are available to strengthen your emotional and mental well-being. My name is Chris Davison. I'm a public governor with um, for Kettering and Corby. I'm deputy lead governor and currently acting lead governor. And on behalf of the Council of Governors, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event. I just want to share with you at a high level some statistics that just make really good reading in terms of the impact that mental health is having on our lives and livelihoods right now. A survey last August from the Office of National Statistics found that almost one in five adults were likely to be experiencing some form of depression compared to one in 10 before the pandemic. And with more than 6 million people receiving antidepressants in the three months from July to September 2020, part of a wider trend and the highest figure on record. Now, whilst mental health is now part of the national conversation, we see it on news, we see it on social media, we do, in my opinion, still have a long way to go in terms of challenging prejudice, tackling stigma and raising awareness. If you have a broken limb, it's very easy to seek your support you need. With a broken mind, the only person who sees it is you. One of the other um, points I'd like to just make you aware, really, is that most people I talk to, as I'm sure you feel, are feeling anxious, worried and fed up. The first, if you like, the novelty of the first lockdown has worn off. Issues around loneliness and isolation, social connectivity, as it I said, is very difficult to, to access. And one of the statistics people talk about is that one in four adults at any one time will be struggling with a mental illness. 
But actually, I have trouble with that statistic. Because I believe it is four in four. Now, what do I mean about that? What do I mean is that actually all of us on the event today have physical health. We all have mental health. We all have emotional health. Bodies change. Minds change. Circumstances change. And goodness me, what a year it has been with the pandemic. How circumstances have changed for us all, for our loved ones, our families and our friends. So actually, it's OK not to be OK. And I think I'd like to share with you on a personal level, despite all I've achieved professionally and personally, and I'm, I'm proud to have achieved a lot. I don't enjoy the best of mental health and have experienced episodes of debilitating depression throughout my adult life which I manage through a combination of medication, talking therapies and self-help, utilising a range of techniques, interventions and support. They do say that the mind is the most powerful muscle in our body. And in normal times, if we wanted to look after our physical health, we might go to the gym, we might go walking, cycling, swimming, a whole range of activities. But how do we nurture our mind? Well, my hope, my ambition, my intention for today is for all of you on this call to be, be able to know where to go in the event of whether you are having a crisis, whether you're just worried or whether you just need someone to talk to. This is about nurturing your body, your mind and your soul and above all, giving you hope. You are not alone. I'm delighted that we're going ahead with today's event. I'd like to thank everyone involved on behalf of the Council for the involvement and you personally for joining the call. I hope you find it informative, instructive, an opportunity to keep that conversation going. That there's no health without mental health. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Richard now for the next part of the event. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thank you, uh, Itai, uh, two uh, very useful uh, perspectives to start this afternoon's um, event um, off. So as you can see from the slide here, we've now got an opportunity to um, pose some questions to our first two, uh, two presenters um, and to provide any feedback that you may have on what you've just heard. So I understand that there is a slight uh, time lag between um, us speaking and you actually hearing what we're saying. So I will uh, attempt to fill that some of that time whilst we get some questions uh, coming in. Um, to start the ball rolling, we've had a question from somebody who's had an experience of uh, accessing mental health services for a relative uh, and struggled really to get um, the uh, response that they wanted from, uh, I think, from their uh, GP uh, surgery. And they're asking, um, what can we do to make doctors more aware um, when people are seeking uh, mental health support? So um, I don't know, Itai, whether you want to, to comment on this question from a, a medical perspective. Uh, yes, I can uh, comment on it. Um, I think um, as we um, uh, develop as um, an integrated care system, uh, some of the conversations that we're having, um, you know, about the different strands, um, you know, of uh, providing men good mental health to our population um, have, you know, really been useful in terms of how we're going to approach addressing this uh, particular point. Um, I recently met some of the clinical leaders, um, you know, in the primary care network, uh, and there's quite a lot of enthusiasm and appetite uh, for us to uh, work much closer together in terms of, um, you know, creating uh, capacity um, uh, in primary care uh, to deal with uh, some of the common uh, mental health problems, uh, improving access uh, to services. Um, and actually developing more uh, general practitioners with a special interest um, uh, in mental health uh, or who can sort of take on uh, that challenge at that level. Uh, so uh, these are initial conversations that we're having um, and, and I completely uh, uh, accept that, you know, the, uh, the experiences vary across, um, uh, across 
across the county, but it's something that is very much on our radar, uh, which uh, we're going to work together as a system uh, to address. Thanks, Utai. That's uh, really helpful. And yes, uh, joining up services across um, uh, primary care, so general practice and secondary care services is a key part of what we're doing at the moment. And as you say, it's it's something that we've got some further work um, to do on. I suppose what I would just probably add to that from a generalist perspective, really, not being a clinician myself, is that whilst there are a number of services for which people do need to see their GP first in order to access, um, some of our services are able open access to self-referral so you can access them um, direct yourself. Uh, IAPT is one of those services and we'll hear a little bit later on um, from uh, colleagues from IAPT about how you can access um, IAPT services so uh, that might be uh, might be an additional piece of information that's worth worth noting. Okay so let's see what other questions we've got coming uh, in here. Um, so a question here, can the statistics around the use of antidepressants be shared uh, again, please? And forgive me, I've forgotten whether it was Itai or Chris that mentioned them, but uh, I don't know whether you could quote them again. Chris. Yes, it was um, the use of antidepressants. It was reported that for a three month period from July to September of last year had increased to the highest record they had. And um, it would it, it just demonstrates, if you like, that medication is, of course, needed and, and required, but there may be other interventions that might help your well-being as a whole. Um, but it was the Office of National Statistics that said that before the pandemic, one in 10 people were going to have an episode of severe depression. That is now increased to one in five as a result of the pandemic which would suggest that would lead potentially to more prescribing of antidepressants, which is important. But as I said in my own piece, this can be a combination of medication, talking therapies and self-help. And as you've said, Richard, we do offer a 24-7 helpline for anyone, whether they are in crisis, worried about a family member or just need somebody to talk to. That was implemented in March just before lockdown. It is run jointly with MIND, our friends and colleagues in MIND. It's staffed 24 seven by mental health navigators that can direct you to the right support at the right time. So going to your GDP is not the only option you need to access. And we will be highlighting the 0800 number later in our presentations. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Yes, and uh, just to highlight that we have, uh, in response to one of the earlier questions, actually listed the 0800 uh, number in the question and answer. So that is the number that Chris is referring to there that is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 0800 uh, 448 uh, 0828, uh, and that's available in the, in the chat function uh, there. OK, we've got another question uh, in here, which um, uh, I don't know whether Itai could answer this one, actually, but I'll, I'll, I'll see um, if he has any any suggestions. So um, the question is, if you could give one piece of advice to somebody in a mental health crisis, what would that be? Seek help um, and don't be afraid um, uh, to seek help. Um, I think sometimes when you're in a you know, very deep crisis, um, you uh, may not be able to, you know, see, um, you know, that a potential solution, um, you know, is uh, is available to you. Um, and some some of the poorer outcomes tend to happen when uh, people feel that they don't have, they feel trapped, and they feel that they are, they don't have uh, options. Um, there are always options, um, and if you seek help, you know, the the O800 number. Uh, if you don't have anyone who's uh, close to you who you can talk to. Um, you know, those are a number of options that you've got. Uh, and if there was a single piece of advice that I would ask uh, people to follow is, uh, is to seek help and uh, don't be alone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Itai. OK, so we're coming to the end of this uh, question time. Of course, there is uh, further opportunity later on in the session to uh, ask uh, ask questions. So we've got a couple of comments in here responding to the suggestions about um, staying active um, and uh, uh, 
the positive impact that being physically active can have on your mental health uh, and well-being. Uh, knowing some of the comments that we've, uh, some of the content I should say that we have um, later on in today's session, I'm going to hold those questions over till later on, as I think there will be some relative uh, relevant content uh, coming up uh, later. So. Uh, um, with that uh, in mind, I think I am now handing over to our next presenters, um, who are two colleagues from the IAPT uh, service, and I'll hand over first uh, to Nathan. Nathan, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, it's a really exciting uh, opportunity for us to come and talk today um, and tell you about the IAPT service and uh, what we do and how easy it is to access our service. So I'm really uh, excited and, and pleased that we could uh, all get together. So thanks very much for joining us. So um, I'm Nathan Clues. I'm the uh, operational manager for Northampton, the South Northampton team within the Change of Minds IAP service. And I'm joined by uh, our service lead, Dr. Sarah Clare, who will be taking us through the second half of our talk. If I could have the uh, next slide, please. So today we're here on what's deemed Blue Monday. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we have some uh, numbers and uh, services available to everybody here um, to help and support people through, uh, which is quite likely to be a difficult time for everybody. And, and as the presenters have said earlier, it, it really is OK not to be OK at the moment. So please reach out. We are here. We're, at, we're here to help as many people as we can. So please don't don't hold back. Please come and talk to us. OK, can I have the next slide, please? So what is IAPT? I, it's not a household name. So improving access to psychological therapies is uh, is what it stands for. Can I have the next screen, please? So just a little bit of a background on, on IAPT, really. Um, Set up in 2008 following a, a report uh, published to show that there was a huge gap within uh, mental health therapy within the whole country. So in 2008 um, in Northamptonshire there were 14 uh, wellbeing workers as we were called there employed um, to join up with the Change of Minds Mental Health Service which was in operation then. Um, and we became the Change of Minds IAP service at that point. So we were a relatively small team but um, since then uh, we joined up and we worked uh, with our GP colleagues and we ran clinics for the GP surgeries um, and from there the, the team has grown substantially and it's huge growth we've got over 120 staff members and we're all trained um, to offer therapy to in an individual basis and we all follow cognitive behavioral therapy and it's CBT so because it's such a large uh, team, we, we've split the team uh, into three sections and three areas. So the central area will um, cover our assessments um, and the north team will cover Rushton, Wellenborough, Kettering and Corby and all the surrounding areas. And the south team, Northampton, Daventry, Toaster, Brackley and all the surrounding areas there. So it's a large area, really large area. Um, and within that, there's a, there's a, a mix of both urban and rural areas and it, it's um, it can be a challenge at times to make sure we can get to everyone. Um, if we can I have the next slide please. So I just wanted to put into context a little bit about the numbers. So nationally, so the IAPT uh, services nationally will uh, see around about 1 million people per year. And so it's a lot of people and in Northamptonshire last year around about 12,000 people with a bump in the road of COVID in there, of course. And at the moment we're targeted to uh, uh, complete 1,350 assessments per month. Now that national uh, target of a million uh, per year is being pushed to 1.5 million. And therefore there are, um, well, we're recruiting 4,500 clinicians nationwide and in Northamptonshire we are um, doing our bit and we are recruiting um, as we speak really. So can I have the next slide please? So who is it who uh, use the IAP service? Well the service is open to anybody who's uh, aged 17 and a half and above um, and we will be looking for um, people to support people who 
um, are struggling with a range of mental health difficulties and it's the common mental health difficulties and as you can see there depression is one of the main ones that we will cover but also the some of the anxiety uh, disorders as well and we're looking at the mild to moderate end of things um, if it's if people are struggling with a more severe and enduring mental health uh, difficulty then there are other services within the trust that can help and support them um, you can have the next slide please so how does it work so we take referrals from gps any healthcare professionals but the probably the the most um the most uh, well the easiest way of doing it for a lot of people is the self-referral so one way is through telephone and that's our 0300 999 1616 number and you can get through to our admin team who will take the details and they will organize a telephone assessment for you um, another really popular way of, of gaining um, access to us is using our online referral form, a self-referral form, which is available 24-7, takes around about two minutes to complete. Um, and then from there, our admin team will contact you and arrange the telephone assessment for you. So the very simple ways of getting in contact with us. So the, what happens at the telephone assessment is our trained staff will complete a, a up to 45 minute uh, telephone assessment now we gather lots of information at, at that uh, from that assessment um, and then we take um, all the information and we talk about in supervision with senior staff and it's just to make sure and ensure that everybody's getting the best possible care from there there's a, a wide variety of treatment options available and, and as i said we all follow the cbt techniques and what we want to do is make sure that people have the tools that they can use moving forward and so it's something that they can take and use forever moving forward um, so to use those techniques sometimes we will offer one-to-one uh, -one support so a, a patient will be supported directly one-to-one -one by uh, one of our therapists um, we also offer computerized CBT and we have a program called Silver Cloud where people can um, complete either a module on depression, for example, and the uh, uh, therapist that supports them can complete regular reviews and um, they can track activity as well. So we can see exactly how much um, interaction the patient has had on, on the, uh, on the uh, online platform. We also run groups and um, we have a, a, a quite a program of groups that are running uh, and they run in a rolling pro process and we also run webinars as well. Uh, and as I said, everything is based all on uh, CBT and um, we look at this in a couple of levels really. So we have the more mild presentation, uh, people will see be seen at the low intensity level and it may be called step two, you may hear that as well. Um, those sessions generally last up to about 30 minutes and we have between four and six sessions. The high intensity is for the more moderate presentation and those sessions are usually around about up to an hour and they can be um, between 12 and 16 sessions generally. Um, and those numbers can and, uh, sort of uh, be, a, be more or less on whatever the need is for the patients. Now there are some uh, mental health difficulties that will necessitate going straight into the high intensity um, mode of therapy and that is all um, that comes from and is uh, identified at assessment. From the treatment at every session we will complete um, outcome measures and these are just quite simple questionnaires that we uh, ask patients to complete each time and it's to measure mood and anxiety um, and it helps also indicate some levels of um, sort of lifestyle and activity and it, it can be used to help sort of um, just indicate improvements and we can plot that on graphs and, and it's quite a nice visual way of showing people how much they've actually improved. Can I have the next slide please? So just currently, I know we've had a question regarding wait times as well. So I just wanted to, the wait time at the moment for an assessment within the IAP service in Northamptonshire is, to, is around about two to three days. It may even be a little bit less than that. It's really very quick at the moment. Um, so I think that's something that we can really take forward and, and it's it just shows how easy it is to access us at the moment. 
we are currently really trying to support our colleagues um, and so uh, well we're trying to support our colleagues in healthcare as much as possible so we're prioritizing healthcare workers um, we are also the staff are currently going through some um, particular specialist training to be able to treat people who are struggling with long covid so we're trying to look forward um, and to try and help people as much as possible going forward and also we've got a long-term conditions team that is just coming on board and we're currently recruiting into those so that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of IAPT and where it began uh, began and uh, where we are and how it, we can access uh, our service but I just um, now we're going to talk about a case study um, so that's going to be switching over to Sarah now so thanks very much and over to Sarah Hello, hi. Um, yes, just as uh, Nathan says, um, you know, this is a really good opportunity to to get to talk um, about the support available in Northamptonshire. So thank you very much for, for tuning in today. So we wanted to um, give a, a case study example. Um, so if you can do the next slide, please. Um, so really looking at thinking about we were focusing a bit more on low mood and depression today. Um, as Nathan said, there'd be um, people coming in initially for a telephone assessment. So that is a pretty quick stage. I mean, I think so sometimes if you phone early, you can even have an on the day assessment. I mean, they're very, 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 very quick. And then that would be a 45 minute assessment. And we would be trying to look and pick up certain themes, certain symptoms and, and um, that we might be able to to focus on what people are sort of struggling with day to day. So when low mood presents and depression presents, um, obviously um, some of the things that we would be thoughtful about is noticing with people were talking about their mood being flat, um, that they were feeling like they would lost focus, that they were um, exhibiting signs of sort of self neglect, not sort of showering, um, brushing their teeth or, or doing the sort of self care things that they would normally do. In general, actually, we tend to find that people end up doing less, um, feeling quite tired, quite lethargic. And therefore, all of that's become sort of quite a negative cycle. People end up withdrawing from life and the normal activities that they would normally do. Um, that leads to increased um, isolation um, and over time this impacts how people might think about themselves and the world and, and the community around them. So those are the sorts of things that we would start to look at and I guess a challenge for us is is that during lockdown and during this this pandemic, um, there's almost been enforced isolation in terms of you know following the rules. Obviously, people people trying to ensure making sure they feel safe, but it's almost um, put people in the sort of conditions that we wouldn't see as typical as it being situations where people would sort of thrive mentally. So we have to be really thoughtful about people's low mood and thinking about how do we um, use structure and routine and and look at activity to try and sort of sort of try and sort of mitigate against some of these symptoms um, that we're finding for depression. The next slide, please. So we're going to assume we've had an assessment and uh, this is um, a gentleman who's a 50 year old male uh, working in the building trade, married with adult children at home. He's got no previous support and the GP has suggested in this situation that um, he either self refers um, or the GP refers to change of minds. Amriapt. Next slide, please. So one of the structures um, um, we look at is thinking about some way of thinking about people's um, symptoms and we use a CBT and Nathan mentioned it earlier as a cognitive behavioural therapy approach and um, predominantly throughout the whole service. Um, so within the assessment we would look at these what we call sort of subsystems and how and if you can see by the diagram this is about how they sort of impact on each other. So we have his thoughts that have, um, have been um, assessed to be I can't be bothered, I'm useless, what's the point in even trying um, in terms of his behaviour, he's not seeing friends, not speaking to his partner, snappier with family, he's stopped all the hobbies and interests, all the normal things uh, that, that he was doing before. In terms of his bodily sensations, there's no sleeping, increased appetite, muscle tension and a tight chest and this is having a knock-on effect on his emotions. He's feeling sad, he's feeling down, he's feeling very miserable, worried and stressed. And as you can see from all the arrows that one how, how we work is that one intervention in any one of these subsets will have a knock on effect on the other. Um, so we need to think about how we intervene and support this gentleman in a way that's going to be the most effective. And within the IAPT service, we follow what we call NICE guidance, which is um, based on loads and loads of research in terms of therapy outcomes and models to see what is the most effective 
effective way of working with someone. And um, so we follow that guidance within IAP to think about how we might um, step by step working with someone trying to to move them from support with someone depression. So we can keep those ideas in mind. Next slide, please. So, I mean, this gentleman, as you uh, as you as Nathan mentioned, has completed some measures for us. So we have a PHQ-9, that's a depression um, um, questionnaire, and that's uh, got a, an, a score in this case of 17, which is moderately um, severe low mood. And the GAD-7 is an anxiety measure. So that's um, a measure of eight. It's just sort of borderline, that sort of mild anxiety. And how we would approach someone within the assessment within IAP, just thinking about where the level of need is. So the step two aspect would be including psychological wellbeing practitioners and senior wellbeing practitioners. And, and the aim at this point is to try and get some of those try to reverse some of those sorts of the basics that have gone um, awry in, in these cases. So looking at someone's structure, looking at someone's routine. And I think one of the questions has been all right already around sort of looking at activity levels. And so it might well be that we sort of focus a lot on, on what people are doing with their day, day to day stuff. You know, how are they looking at the self care? Are they looking at sleep hygiene, things that we would see as basic um, drives for, for sort of taking control and, and having agency and, and creating structure and routine for yourself. So we would always look at some of the base because it's quite amazing about if you tend to some of that and look at your exercise and look at your, your eating and looking at some of those, those those sort of very basic things that we do day to day. If we get those right, that actually that often hugely lifts the mood and that often that activity level was the first and easier place we start with with depression because it's the easiest way to shift and increase motivation. So activity increases motivation. If you get out on walks, it increases endorphins. All of those things will, will lift your mood. So that's often the easiest place for us to start. So people will often go in at step two to try and get some of those basics. Also in terms of psychoeducation around models and things, so people can get a real good idea about, about how the dep depression has developed and, and what they need to do to combat it in very quick and easy ways so we can start to try and get people some sense of having some skills. People, that might be enough for, for a lot of people. Otherwise, um, people will be what we call stepped up into our step three level of care, which is where we have quite a high range of, of therapy staff there. So we have CBT, but we also have um, interpersonal therapy, which is a, a particular counselling model for depression. We have counselling for depression um, and we also have more for in terms of sort of um, PTSD and, and some of the other anxiety disorders, EMDR. Um, so here alongside, we were talking about depression today, but you would have a step two for anxiety, a lot of your sort of relaxation, mindfulness and some, um, uh, I guess, some sort of exposure to sort of, sort of manage uh, increasing your tolerance or worry management of, of certain things that come up. But within the step three, we're probably looking a little more about um, therapy, which would be weekly um, therapy for an hour, looking at sort of OCD, um, social anxiety, the panic disorders, the more sort of specialist sort of um, anxiety disorders at that point. So where um, it would happen in terms of the assessment would be about meeting the needs of the individual. So some people might benefit straight away from, from step two. Our waiting times there are pretty much, I mean, I think I did a just a sample the other day and I think everyone had, um, I think 80% were in a step two session within the first two weeks from the uh, feedback from the assessment. Um, so uh, we got quite high um, accessibility at step two. If we were to do things like the online, um, online, uh, the sort of online package, which has depression, anxiety, there's a lot of different modules, that's immediate access and you can even access that before you even have an assessment. So we would try and get some of that skills based stuff in very, very quickly. Um, the if someone hasn't, you know, feels like they need um, more in terms of after the initial sort of um, initial work at step two, then obviously people would be reviewed at step three and reassessed at that point, just making sure CBT is the right model, because it might well be that one of the other approaches um, has come up or it might well be that through some learning and, and talking um, with the client, that it might well be that, uh, you know, maybe a different direction is needed. So we always have a refresh and a review, make sure that we're, um, you know, working together um, with the client, making sure everyone's sort of um, happy in the direction we're going and we would review and then access step three if that was necessary. So I guess depending, I mean, for this chap in particular, I mean, I think there were lots of stuff, um, lots of um, worries and concerns about you know, dropping, dropping all sort of old hobbies and um, interests and, and 
some area around sort of sleep hygiene and things. So these sorts of things would be our first step two intervention for this gentleman. And he could access, as, as Nathan said, that could be in a group who we felt people were quite socially isolated or, or individually or online that would be supported. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we do, you know, what will come up on the assessment is that someone will ask you about whether what goals you have. And so we aim this as in a very targeted way because to be goal focused, to be sort of positive about and very clear about what you're trying to achieve. You know, if, if we could wave a magic wand and you were, and things felt better, what would be looking different in your in your day to day life? Um, and that gives us some targets and ID. They need to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. So we've got a few goals um, for that uh, this gentleman set in his assessment about exercising and speaking to friends and getting into a good sleep pattern. So that lends itself very well to, to a very quick and, and focused step two piece of work in order to, to get someone's um, activities levels up, which we know from experience and from nice guided um, sort of research that, that lifts people's mood and, and gets people's focus. Next slide, please. So we would start at step two and I think there's all sorts. I mean, one of the questions has been around, you know, sort of thinking about ideas and uh, what, how we break this down in terms of activity is that we look at routine activity, we look at necessary, obviously there's chores, there's things that we can't get away from, but also um, pleasurable activities. And what we tend to find in people um, who have low mood is that they've managed to sort of drill down their life into a very sort of routine and necessary activity. So they're doing the bare, bare minimum of the things that they have to do. And what tends to go, especially through stress, um, is the things that maybe actually balance some of that out for them. So they stopped doing the things that make them feel good or, or give them time out for themselves. So one of the things we're doing is having a look at the, the, the whole stretch of activity over the week. Often see people may not be very activated at all and look at a graded um, approach of introducing um, a quite a wide range of routine, pleasurable, and necessary activities and building that up over time. And that's going to be at the, the sort of pace of, of the person that, that's sort of, you know, making these changes. And in a way that, you know, with an individual therapist, you can problem solve. So there might well be obstacles and or difficulties. There might be, um, as people we're suggesting thinking about sort of long term health conditions or, or anything or childcare or all sorts of things that we need to balance. So that's why it's individualised to the person to sort of have a look at their particular circumstances um, and, and trying to sort of problem solve and, and look at look at how that can be created, because it's important to, I guess, to support the person being able to to get permission to do that sometimes. Um, and so we were looking at things like activity levels, we're looking at hobbies, we're looking at past interests, we're looking at things that they do on their own, but maybe some, some things they might do with others. I, I know Dr. Smart's going to be talking about this later. So huge passion around sort of walking and exercise and how that can impact on mood. So we're a big pro uh, proponents of that as well. You know, it's important to, to get outside, use mindfulness, get into the um, the energies, get in, into the nature and use the opportunities to exercise both indoor and outdoor, outdoor, outdoors, I can't speak now, um, but also in terms of looking at possible sort of social opportunities, whether that's on social media, you know, connecting into local groups, um, some people are volunteering, some people are getting their DIY done. Um, so before before they're, they're doing now um so it's looking at trying to to look at quite a wide variety of of activities that that suit people some people have, have dropped things that they used to love and do playing playing instruments cooking things they've never had time to do with normal circumstances that we're trying to encourage people to do now um so this is something that we might think about with this gentleman around reconnecting with friends um how to um speak maybe express himself with his partner in a way that would feel more positive and more or more helpful in a way that he can feel heard. Um, so any obstacles to that we'll be exploring, obviously reintroducing hobbies. Next slide, please. And and the more the step three, I mean, it can be introduced at step two, some some initial initial introduction to sort of the thought work. But often when we've lifted the mood and people are feeling um, that um, feel a bit more motivated, engaged, and the emotional arousal and the distress is sort of removed, you know, sort of at least reduced. We have a lot more opportunity to engage with people and think a little bit about how their thoughts might be also impacting 
how they're feeling you know are they thinking about things in a certain way like I'm useless I mean it's, it's a very sort of negative label to attach to yourself and it's very global globally very negative and actually we'll probably find that if we think about it you know you wouldn't apply that to anyone else in, in such global terms you shouldn't apply that to yourself and there'll be all sorts of ways that we can start to look at that and unpick that maybe understand where it's come from maybe a little bit about okay so we understand maybe maybe you were told that for some reason by someone when you were young and you sort of adopted it but actually when we look at you as an adult and the things that you're doing um, there'll be all sorts of ways that we can think about how we challenge and challenge that so that's one example of a style of thinking in terms of labeling is the, is the terminology for that one in particular that we might start to look at and start to unpick so we look at identifying unhelpful styles of thinking we challenge thoughts um, and uh, we also might otherwise do sort of positive logs as, as well okay uh, next slide just to um, make you aware, um, we've been having quite a huge um, pandemic sort of response. Um, we've been uh, working a lot with the general hospitals, trying to provide some frontline support. Obviously, we've we've got in some extra staff and some external staff, which while wow, the you know, wait times are are reduced as much to a minimum as, as we can make them for frontline staff. That's immediate support. Um, we're doing um, sessions on telephone on Microsoft Teams. We've been um, contacting over 65s and people in shielding groups, um, staff in care homes, um, doing what we can to try and support our, our local our local community and reaching out to lots of different um, stakeholders, I guess, in terms of trying to to think about how we can um, spread sort of support and make it appropriate to what people need. So, for example, with speaking to GP surgery today and thinking about how we support staff there, or it might be local communities and, and areas where we, we might be thinking about, say, Asher Deep has been one that comes to mind last week. So we're trying to think about how we can we can work the best with the community. So this is a real passion for us is a real community working. Next slide, because we do need to move on. Um, so we've put the numbers up. So just in case you didn't get that, um, the, the self referral is the the 0300 999 1616. Um, and uh, if you phone, telephone that and say, well, you'll often if we can't get immediately get to the phone, you'll get an answer um, back within or a call back within five, 10 minutes. And that's how we sort of register people. People can access that. It's um, uh, it's a number that's, that's available. You can self-refer yourself. There's no need to go through GP. Otherwise, there's immediate access to online support um, through the website um, that's been um, uh, that's on the slide. Um, we have fast access to assessment, priority for healthcare workers, and we tailor everything to the individual that comes through. So I hope I hope that helps. So I think should we go over to questions and answers? Thanks very much, Thanks uh, very much. Sarah. 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 We've had some questions had coming some through questions on coming the through chat on the and um, I'll try and um, cluster some of the questions around a similar topic uh, together in the interests uh, of time. So um, there's quite a lot of interest in um, support for long COVID. And I know this is something that is em emergent at the moment. We're still working it uh, working it through, but I don't know whether uh, Nathan or Sarah could say um, a brief word about uh, long COVID support that we're able to offer. What are our sort of immediate next steps when might people see uh, something coming available from us? Should we bring uh, Sarah in? I think you're muted, Sarah. I'm muted. Sorry, there is a long COVID um, response team within um, within the area, and that's that's a um, so a team that we've been liaising with very closely with recently. Um, so I think there's sort of levels and tiers of, of need, and I and so we will be people will be referred to the long COVID team through GPs, is my understanding. Um, and then if there's any people that we think that might be um, specific that for IAPT in terms of sort of levels of severity, then we will get referrals direct from the long COVID team. Um, so we've got some specialist train, training that's been rolled out throughout all of the staff from the IAP national team. So that's been centrally um, held. So people are equipped in terms of supporting people with long COVID, but also with things like um, trauma um, for sort of being spending time in hospitals and ICU. So we've had some specialist training around that. OK, thank you. So I've got a, a couple of questions here about how to access uh, IAP. So one is uh, a quick one, hopefully. Is the 0300 number free to call? Yes. Excellent. 
that's really good to hear. Um, and um, another one around um, services for young people. So we posted some information about our child, adolescent and mental health services um, in the chat. And there's a link there to the NHFT website, which describes a little bit more about the CAM services uh, and uh, and what they do. Um, I don't know whether either Sarah or Nathan are able to, to comment. I know we've got a session coming up that we'll talk a little bit more about um, services available um, relating to depression. But is there any additional comment that you wish to make at this stage regarding a younger person looking for support um, with depression? I think there's quite a number of sort of local support sort of counselling services that um, that are that are very good. We often liaise with, but often um, yes, I mean, like it's CAMS is our is our internal NHFT service. Um, we work from 17 and a half upwards, um, and we take some referrals straight from CAMS. But yes, I think it's probably not feeling quite the expert on the child mental health side of things. I'm afraid. OK, thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, you mentioned in your presentation um, prioritisation of uh, healthcare workers. Um, does this include uh, care home staff? Yes, yes. Um, we've telephoned all of the um, care homes across the whole of the county during this pandemic. Um, we did it initially in the very first lockdown. The Trust has also done a second round. Psychologists within the Trust have done that. Um, so they're very aware of, of how to refer referring and we have also a like a staff support we have um, a particular team that's just being developed now who's centralizing requests that come in from say hospitals or, or gp surgeries or care homes and then um some of that work in terms of support is coming and being, being centralized from there i mean i at the moment is is when sort of the primary agency is going out but as that develops i think you know lots more of the staff that have been wanting to volunteer to support a, a volunteer volunteering for that, so that will be spread out across um, those volunteers within the Trust. Fantastic, thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question before we finish this particular uh, uh, session. Um, so we've got a couple of questions we haven't got around to, but we will provide an answer to those um, in the chat function. Um, and the question, sorry, back to you, uh, to Sarah again. Um, what would go into a positive log? Ah. <laughs> It's a positive diary. Sorry, it's our terminology. It's a positive diary. So, so for example, the, the I'm useless thought. Um, you might want to go. Well, okay, let's have a let's have a look at the evidence for. If we were to take that thought to court, what would we, what would how would we weigh that up? And actually, we started to get people to orientate to actually the sorts of things that they were doing. Um, it would be a positive. It end up being a positive diary, actually demonstrating all the things that they do do because we do do things. Um, and it might be that that's been minimised or, or people aren't paying much attention to it or getting it watch it's about sometimes even getting a shower brushing your teeth and starting the day for some people is a is a mammoth you know is, is a big achievement from where people have been started so i think it's just starting to is one of those ways of starting to challenge some of those unhelpful styles of thinking that we can all drop into every now and then Thanks very much, uh, Sarah. And as I say, we have got a few more questions that we haven't had a chance to answer, um, as it were, verbally, but we will res respond using the, the chat function. Um, the time has just edged past uh, 10 past uh, three. We have uh, thankfully planned for a short break uh, now to allow people to get up and uh, stretch their legs uh, and get a, a cup of uh, a tea. So we are due to start uh, again at 3.20 um, with uh, Dr. David Smart. So um, we shall have about uh, uh, nine or ten minutes uh, worth of uh, a break. So we'll be starting back again at uh, 3.20. Thanks very much.
Hi everybody. Hopefully you can now hear me. It's Krishni Waring again. I just wanted to welcome you back after the break. I hope you managed to um, ease away from the screen and uh, just have a moment to stretch your legs and look after your well-being as that's the, the focus of our event today. Um, I, I hope you found the presentations we've done so far interest, really interesting, as interesting as I've found them, certainly. Uh, we heard a lot about our IAP service and the range of things that people can do um, in terms of accessing services uh, and the way in which the services work. I'm now delighted to welcome Dr. David Smart. Uh, David is one of our um, uh, local GPs, uh, works with the North Hunts GP Alliance. And David is going to be talking about um, the various ways in which you can access um, support within the community. Uh, and I think there'll be some insight into things that maybe we can do ourselves as well, a little bit of um, self-care. So I'm really delighted uh, David has taken time out to, to join us and uh, over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thanks, thanks, Krishni, for, for this. And uh, in true um, Chris Whitty style, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I'm a GP, um, actually a GPA Alliance. We cover Northampton and uh, we work in partnership with um, other federations across um, the county. Um, but I'm, you know, have been a, a, a GP. I've literally just retired. So we're living in times of change. And clearly that's a time of change for me. In actually moving away from um, my, my practice, which I've had for 30 years. Um, but so. What, what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about this whole aspect of a personalised approach. And this is coming together from the Community Mental Health Framework for Adults and Older Adults. And this is new new framework, which I was had the privilege of being one of the expert advisory panel. And it's really looking at some of the gaps that we, we can have um, in, in services. And this is where the long term plan money is going to be spent and putting this into practice. But it's the real opportunity I've been trying to work over 30 years in mental health commissioning and help set up IAPT and various other things in the past and um, with changing minds. But it's how we can bring things together. And I think this is a service that um, we'd want, I would want, and I've had to use mental health services myself as my own GP. And I've had four of my family members with um, who've been suicidal and three admitted. So I have lived experience as a carer as well, um, which I think is important to kind of to bring this, this in. I, with, with prevention better than cure, the prevention concordat, that may not have meaning, but it's worth Googling. The prevention concordat from Public Health England has just been launched. We may have a focus on the crisis care pathway. I think hopefully we can begin to consider giving as much attention to the prevention um, care pathway because there's a good evidence base. Some things I'm going to talk through um, can have significant um, effect. And so Next slide, please. This is one of the key things I just want to flag up as we're in these COVID times and these difficult times. There's a very good paper for those who are interested in that, that uh, COVID pandemic is not a pandemic, it's a syndemic. I'd never heard of that word before, but it's S-Y-N-demic, S-Y-N-demic. Um, and, and basically, if you put in syndemic and lance it into Google, you'll come up with the article. But it's basically saying the key thing we need to be thinking about is how COVID as an infectious disease has interacted with inequalities and some of the other predisposing factors around mental health as a non-communicable disease to make it a much bigger and compounding problem. And so therefore, if we're going to, you know, we have the hope of this vaccine coming out. So we live in an age of hope in 2021. Um, and that's something we can grasp at this difficult time. We have hope. Um, but we also need to be recognising what COVID is teaching us and what the aspects around us of addressing inequalities and mental health. And we know mental health does not have the funding it should. It has 24% of the disease burden and about 11% of the cost of the funding. So there's much we can do um, to, be, to, to be involved in, in getting this moving forward. And then, so the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this. This slide talks a bit of some of the work that we're, we're doing together. I recognise you're not going to be able to see all of that, but you can see there are five boxes moving from the left where you have self-care and prevention through primary care and towards emergency and acute care. 
And one of the aims we have is to achieve this left shift. You may be surprised to know that 61% of the budget for depression actually lies with the acute trust. That's not the mental health trust, that's actually Northampton Journal and Kettering. And so how we actually think of how we can move money to get it to where it's needed in prevention and in the community um, is really something we need to be thinking through together. I have a great privilege that you know, Richard, actually, Richard Smith actually brought this paper together. We were part of a um, joint venture between NHFT and GPA. And also great news that just before I retired, I found out this has been um, granted as a, a finalist for HSJ partnership awards. So that's something we're doing together. So working together in primary, secondary care and the voluntary sector, IAPT team are all parties um, to this piece of work. And the aim is to get an integrated pathway all the way from public health on the left, all the way through to treatment resistant depression on the right. Now you think, well, I've been working this for 30 years. Why hasn't this happened? And the reason is each of these five components have different commissioners and they work in, in the past. We've had siloed thinking. We now have movement towards an integrated care system and opportunity, particularly in Northamptonshire with the partnership work that's gone on to move forward in, in, in a really quite significant way. And the next slide, please. So really this, that's more kind of what I'd call maybe the system thinking. This is a bit of a, a journey and, and a bit of my own journey where you can actually just come down this issue of moving from stress, distress, disease, where we're really feeling a bit uncomfortable through to that level of then moving into disease where we need actually to get help and, and, and really have a diagnosable condition. But the opportunity we have, and this is where the prevention can call out and a lot of work coming out is suggesting the opportunity is some of the interventions that both can help prevent us entering into a disorder can actually be helpful in our recovery. So this provides a real bridge and a real early intervention. There's a lot of evidence based on mental health interventions. Early intervention matters, does for psychosis, does for depression. And the longer you leave it, the more ingrained and the more neuronal change happens. So actually early intervention matters. Um, and then 90% of this we know actually is managed in primary care. And I've been trying to work with my primary care colleagues um, to get this in place. And I'll talk a bit about two, of, well, there are two, lots of new workers coming to primary care. And this social prescriber link worker, who is literally somebody who's coming into the networks of practices working together. So primary care networks now are lots of practices linking together, working together. They employ people and they employ social prescriber link workers who link people to the voluntary sector. And so these are some of the things that we just need to be aware of and how we can link people to what works and what, what can be helpful. But this, the key thing here is, is bio, psycho, social, and I would argue spiritual approach we need to our recovery. And just my own issues, I was quite overwhelmed after grief of my, lost my sister when I was 18. And, um, you know, then that was a sudden death with epilepsy. But she then, um, that, that grief then re-emerged when my parents died. And so I then had to get my own help. And I would guess, again, my, myself as a GP with all this experience, I needed help. And I had to go out and reach help and got good help from um, psychological therapies. And I'd recommend others to do the same. As it, I said, reach out and get help. That's one of the key messages that we're trying to get across today. And it can happen to anyone. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Now, this is one of my most beautiful slides, which I love. But I absolutely recognise you're not going to be able to see it. But I do want you to recognise the top bit, which says the Foresight Mental Capital and Wellbeing Project. They locked um, people away, the biggest experts around wellbeing for two years. They came out with this awesome report, which unfortunately never really was taken up because there was a change in government. But it, what it does is it demonstrates our biology in the bottom. Um, there's, there's inflammation. Inflammation matters to our mental health. If you have good biome in your gut, then that uh, alters your mental well-being and your inflammation in your body. So actually healthy eating matters to your biology and to your gut. It also says sleep and nutrition. So these things interact together. So we really need to be looking at our sleep in a major way and having good sleep hygiene. The, 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 the trajectory also describes adverse childhood events. If you have an adverse childhood event, it lowers the trajectory. We know that a third 
of the mental health, adult mental health disorder is relatable to adult to child, adverse childhood events. So a trauma in, in, in um, a trauma informed service, which we're developing in North Hans is, is really important. Drugs and alcohol also limit your capacity. If you drink those, have those in, in youth. We know the youth emerging mind have these effects. So the, all these things interact and, 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 and to progress. So next slide, please. But it's too complicated, I would argue. But um, so this is a simpler version. So th th what happened with the Foresight Report is New Economic Foundation came along and they developed what's called Five Ways to Wellbeing. Now, I tease my public health colleagues because they can rarely remember what the five ways are. They are the same as great. So giving, relating, exercising, awareness and trying out are the same as the five ways. But also positive psychology in the word of Martin Seligman has come on with the, the, the more attitudinal aspects, the internal aspects. And we heard from Sarah talking about having goals and goal setting direction is really important. How do we bounce back with, with resilience? And I'll talk a bit more on that. And emotions, acceptance and meaning. And again, I love that the quote from Viktor Frankl, I think it was from Nietzsche, who actually said those have a reason for why I can survive almost anyhow. So being part of something bigger can actually give us direction and, and, and help. This is promoted by Action for Happiness, and we've been working with Action of Happiness for the last decade. Um, I have, and we've got a hub of us working together in Northampton. And we've now been granted some funding to take this forward into Happy Cafes Network with public health. And, um, and so that's really exciting to see that. And there are, the cafes can then also run courses. So we can also run courses. And we're running those and will be in adult education. Um, so this is some real opportunity. There's an app <clears throat> because we know that you need nudging. We know we need little nudges every day, little reminders, just to remind us of what to do and just little prompts. So small steps matter and um, can move you forward. So small little things every day can be really helpful. So there's courses available, there's apps, there's a great YouTube. You can listen to some of the best international speakers on the Action of Happiness channel. It's much better than American Housewives, I can promise for your well-being. So um, that, that I would recommend that one. <clears throat> OK, so I'm, just going to go, I'm not going to go through all of the 10. I'm just going to um, you know, catch a, you know, four of, of, of the these. So next slide, please. I think this is where I feel. I just kind of wanted to reflect where are we? And I thought, well, that's what we need now. We need ways we can bounce back. And you heard a bit of the changing minds in the IAPT model there. How can we do this? I, I love this. That you, if you can't change it, then think about how you, you know, think about the way you change how you think about it. And that's what uh, summarizes a little bit of, of what Sarah was saying. Um, and accept what you can't change. I you know, love the, the um, serenity prayer. You know, God grant me serenity to accept the things you cannot change, courage to change you, courage to change the things you can and wisdom to know the difference. Um, so that that to me is how I've try to live my life a bit. And then thinking, well, what, what does resilience mean in these terms? So I use the 10 keys, I reflect on the 10. It's a menu, um, not a prescription. So that's really important. You're not gonna do all of these 10 every day, but over, over a week, just you know, well, a month, try and think of how you're putting them into your life. <clears throat> and um, so the next slide, please. So they're just gonna talk about mind, body and soul a bit. So we've talked about the mind and this is, something just to you know, be honest with yourself where you are. Don't, don't, I'm not wanting you to say I'm happy when you're not, and you can't be happy all the time. These, these 10 keys are happier living. If you've got inequalities, if you haven't got food on the table, if you haven't got some of the other aspects of a Maslow's hierarchy, then you know, those need to be addressed as well. But what can we do to focus on the good bits? Now this can be a bit tricky, but the next slide may give you a few tips. This is a really interesting um, exercise, which I'd encourage you to do, is before you go to bed at night, just think about three things and write them down. Writing always in psychology helps it, helps our right and left mind work, and it helps us to do it. So write three things that um, you found just um, and, you know, helpful and went well, but also just reflect on them a bit. Just give a bit of a minute or two just for each one. And actually, this is a study that showed actually just doing that for a week. That's all they did this for, for one week. And you can see the well-being going up for six months afterwards. That's pretty staggering. And it's actually our brains give attention to what's working rather than what's 
moving into a negative phase. So these little things, I've got a, now my daughter's given me a, a, a gratitude diary, a six minute gratitude diary, it's brilliant. So it's three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the evening, just a bit of attention to the day, put your glasses on of how you're going to view the day in a slightly more positive way. Give attention to what's you know, a bit more good going on in life. And that, there's a lot of evidence that that, that, that demonstrates that can, that can help. Next slide, please. It's a bit on the mind. What about the body? It's taking exercise in the, in the five ways or, or, or 10 keys, um, but take care of the body. And in, in the 10 keys, it focuses on the whole body, really. So it's actually this aspect of eating. I mentioned the gut biome. I'll mention it again because it's important. You know, you are what you eat. If you eat rubbish, you'll feel rubbish. And so actually, you know, I had people come to me in GP surgery. One guy came in, he had palpitations and I could smell coffee on him. So I said, well, how much coffee do you have? He had two big cafetiers a day. So I said, what about cutting back? And he did and he felt better. That was a surprise. Um, so actually, you know, do be careful about uh, fizzy drinks as well. You know, all of these other sugars, they can infect uh, or affect our minds. So what we eat and drink alcohol. We know a lot of people during lockdown have been drinking more. Um, and I think that's really something we need to be cautious of and, and be careful and drawing attention to healthy eating and drinking. Um, but exercise, very good evidence base of exercise, particularly in the morning, um, it can really help. Secondly, um, in, it, there's good evidence base that it can also improve outcomes, even for people who have mental disorder. So actually it can both help prevent mental disorder and help. And as Sarah said, it's addressing your body tension and um, you know, that can be, be very effective, um, that, that, that can help all of that, particularly if you do it with somebody else, have a buddy to go with, because there'll be times when you just don't want to do it. It's too cold, too dark or whatever. But just have a buddy and that can be. Next slide, please. And meaning, I think being part of something bigger, um, this is what this, this means. I think um, having a sense of hope, and, and we are in a season of hope, um, being part of a community, and like that Viktor Frankl quote I, 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 said, I said earlier, and um, I'm gonna talk a bit about faith earlier, but 40% of people, their faith can matter to how they help with their recovery. So just being aware of people's spiritual nature, people may, may not have any faith at all, and that's okay. They may have just a group and people involved in the football team, or even just part of the NHS. I, do miss being part of my team at, at Leicester Terrace. That, that's something I miss because I saw part of something bigger. I am obviously continuing within the NHS with GPA. Next slide, please. A couple of things now. What can you do? Here's um, a link. You can do, do this bitty link, bit.ly. Then A for H North Hans is our, is our commonality of all of the work you can look at around um, some of the issues around um, you know, our Twitter feeds or whatever feeds you want to get hold of. And I, there's also um, a feed, which I'll see if I can just get hold of. Is the, um, if you go to um, Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E, then forward slash A for H North Hans, you'll have a list of all, a lot of other resources that are there that you can link up to. Next slide, please. But you can follow us and, and do that. So what have we done about this? What did I do in, in general practice? I tried to make sure this was linked up with uh, the, you know, all of the work around the social prescribing, and I've covered that, the cafes I've talked it through, and this great partnership with Sarah and the IAP service. And we are looking at providing these practical ideas courses in the four cafes ar around town. Um, and you know, so we will, will be doing that um, and, and when cafes open. Clearly, they're not open at the moment. But we are doing some meetups, and uh, you can go online with Action of Happiness and link with our meetups. Next slide, please. And then the IAP partnership, this is great work. And what we did was to bring these courses together and we, we thought we could put this onto this new directory of service, which is coming. We are very hopeful that spring social prescribing at scale will be coming, but um, this My Directory of Service, which is available now, but we couldn't get it housed in the right way. So currently we're looking at the GPA website, it's the General Practice Alliance website, um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more on that later. Next slide, please. So those are courses which are coming. Green social prescribing. This is really good opportunity. Delapri Abbey, I'm also a trustee at Delapri Abbey. And um, the opportunity of opening up this glorious 550 acres of parkland, volunteering helps. 
befriending walks. We're doing that with Age UK. Or walks. I would just mention or walks. That's uh, just if you just go for a walk and just uh, just notice things, but just stop and really, really notice and allow a sense of awe to come in. That kind of sense. That is a very good evidence base that helps with uh, well-being as well. And I've given a couple of other things you can do there outside. So the Abbey is going to be our virtual hub, and we are thinking of how we can do um, yeah, community lectures there. And there is going to be some champions training. We've now got funding for this. We are going to be training volunteers around um, how you can put the 10 keys into your personal life and into frontline staff. And so we've been training frontline staff and volunteers together around this. And that, that course is, should be coming over the next couple of months. Next slide, please. And I think I'm coming into land. You're pleased to know. Wellbeing Sunday with Blue Monday yesterday. We had this awesome uh, content across the whole diocese of Peterborough, all of Northamptonshire. Cambridgeshire and uh, Rutland, all of the chapters of the clergy being trained in these resources. And uh, I was on Radio Northampton and ITV News um, around this. So really exciting to see this partnership working, happening. And we're now putting these resources um, from Rock North Hans, that's going to be stay there. Um, but that's, if you look at that, resources will be there, held there for um, churches and other faith groups. I'd love other faith groups to come on board. That's not, we're not uh, precious about that. Um, time to talk, obviously coming up, and that's the 4th of February. And do just remember how we address stigma together. So those opportunities. And next slide, please. So really another bit of our project, and just we keep telling you these numbers, but we make no apology for that, because actually these, this is what you can do to help yourself. So this is what I used to text my patients when I was a GP. I used to give them the well-being plan, and that's if you go to North Hans GP Alliance, um, being you know, go to mental health, you'll get uh, North Hans GP Alliance. But mental health, you'll get the um, the link, and you can just go down further down. It will be my well-being action plan. If you did what I've just said, you'll actually get there some films on that website as well. Um, so lots of resources there, and you've got those two key telephone numbers. Do um, take a picture or do something, just get those into your phone, because those are the telephone numbers you need, talking therapies and single point of access 24 seven. And then really the last slide is just what I hope you'll remember is the great dream, 10 keys to happier living and action for happiness. Give them a Google, look at the website and get engaged because it's helped me. I would promise you it's helped me. I testified that myself, that I've used it with my patients with cards and it's helped loads of people give me good feedback and we look forward to developing a social movement and getting Northamptonshire and the world happy. We'll start with Northamptonshire and then we'll move on but uh, yeah thank you very much. Thanks back to you Richard. Wow, thanks very much, uh, David. So much uh, useful content uh, there. And I know we've had a few questions in saying, how can I get hold of a copy uh, of the slides? Don't worry, uh, we will be circulating all of the slides used by uh, today's presenters after the event. So, so long as you uh, registered to attend, uh, you will receive a copy uh, in, in your email. So uh, we now move into a, another opportunity to pose some questions or to make uh, some comments about uh, what you've uh, just uh, heard. I think certainly what I was taking away from uh, what David was uh, was saying was the importance of just joining up some of our health and care services and indeed joining up our health and care services with other services provided by the local voluntary sector uh, and even the even the private sector locally and um, certainly I know we're well on the road uh, to doing that in parts of uh, uh, Northamptonshire, um, not least in Northampton, where um, David was describing work is 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 um, really charging charging ahead. Um, I think the other aspect really that, that that struck me, which is I think exemplified here on the Great uh, Dream slide, but but also was mentioned in in David's earlier part of his presentation, which is the fact that. Um, really good mental health and wealth, well-being is as much about how we live our life as about mental health itself. So the biopsychosocial um, and spiritual elements that David referred to earlier on all have a positive aspect, uh, a positive affect, I should say, on our mental health um, and, uh, and well-being. OK. So um, I think there's a question coming in here about the uh, the happy cafes, which I will pose to to David. So, David, could you describe a little bit more about the the happy uh, happy cafes? Uh, where where can we access them them from? That's brilliant. Um, we had some funding from Public Health um, 
for Northampton. There, were, there was Johnny's Place, is a happy cafe in Kettering, that's been going for a number of years with very good uh, benefit to a lot of people in that area. A happy cafe is simply, uh, you, know, you can register as a happy cafe, anybody could do this, but it's a place um, from the act of happiness where you actually have a warm welcome, but typically there's courses and resources. So typically there are other, other events happening around trying to promote well-being. Um, and what we've got is, and I'll, I'll try and remember this, it's African Association of Zim Women, um, the Umbrella Fair, and I'm going to forget the other two. Um, but because uh, we did change, uh, the, there are four four cafes that, which are happening, but um, we are hoping to get one at uh, Delapre as well. Um, and but they're across the town. Um, but I will, having embarrassed myself by forgetting where the other two are, um, but that, that's hopefully giving enough information. But we look forward to other cafes developing and, and being uh, being available. Thanks, uh, David. And, and, and worth saying that we are um, sending some information out uh, after the session so we can include some uh, extra details um, for those that are interested with those um, materials. So whilst people are having a think about whether there are any final questions that they may have, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague just to move us on to the next slide as we're going to seek some feedback on uh, today's session. So we, we're really hopeful at the outset that by providing some more information about the services that we provide that when you leave the session today, you'd feel more comfortable and confident in, in accessing the services. So we're just going to repeat the uh, the Slido poll that we had um, earlier on to see if there's been a change in terms of people's knowledge of how to access uh, mental health services. So again, I can ask you to uh, log into the Slido app. Uh, you can either use the QR code uh, on your phone um, by uh, uh, hovering over the uh, the image on your screen, or you can access uh, the Slido uh, webpage using the link which we shall post uh, in just a moment. So if I could encourage you to go back into Slido um, and uh, we'll see if we have an improvement in terms of people's knowledge of how to access uh, mental health services um, within Northamptonshire. So whilst uh, people are getting their uh, responses into Slido, I appreciate it takes uh, a minute or so to get uh, logged in, or at least it takes me a minute or so to, to get logged in. I'll come back to some of the uh, questions that we've got um, coming in. Um, so um, I'll uh, pose this one to, to David actually. David, we talked about crisis cafes um, and we've talked about um, happy cafes. What's the difference? That's a really good good point. The, um, the crisis cafe is, is really, you know, really if you're feeling in distress and feeling you, you need urgent help and you want somebody to talk to in the here and now and it's a great, um, you know, again, that's an award-winning um, cafe development by um, NHFT. It's a place people can go to instead of necessarily perhaps going down to accident emergency or other place where there may be mental health resource. They, you know, people can talk to a, a mental health professional one-to-one. -one. So it's more if you kind of got that acuity of, of, of distress. Whereas a happy cafe is more one way actually is trying to encourage people to maybe to think of their well-being. People you know, aren't necessarily in crisis at that stage, but thinking how they can improve their well-being. And it's interesting the point you made earlier, Richard, it's actually, I think, um, the NHS, as I leave the NHS as a clinician, makes only 20% of difference to our outcomes. 40% is being made by our behaviour changes. So what we eat, drink, smoke, our weight, our exercise. So actually, um, the more we can actually think about the happier aspect, what about our well-being, then the less hopefully we may be needing to utilise the crisis, maybe a, a way of, of framing it. But um, we are linking the IAPT services into the Happy Cafe so Service, supporting those so that we can actually have those volunteers supported with them. Thanks, uh, David. Uh, I'm really pleased to see, so far at least, uh, we're looking um, positive in terms of the response to our polling question. Um, people do seem to be pretty uh, confident in terms of um, how to access mental health services, which is uh, really, really good news. Um, so we're going to switch back to the slides now, but do, if you haven't had a chance to uh, respond to the poll, please do so, um, because um, we are very interested in um, your response and the poll will continue um, to run in the background. Um, so before I hand over to Krishni for some closing remarks, there's one other question here um, that I think is uh, for David uh, again, actually. Um, David, is happiness synonymous with good mental health? That's a really good, um, good question. Um, you can still have mental disorder um, and have, have um, well-being, so that they don't actually run in, in actual um, as a continuum. 
Um, so that's one thing to say. Um, but happiness, I think it says two types of happiness. It's hedonic happiness, which is um, mediated by some quick fix receptors, so that which can be addictive, like chocolate. You can get feel a bit of happiness when you have a bar of chocolate, or you feel a bit of a lift. Um, but that's what we're talking really about. The good thing is eudonomic happiness, and that's really that deeper connectedness, a sense of flourishing and well-being. And that type of happiness, that eudonomic happiness, is actually very closely correlated with good mental health and, and actually general health. Thanks, Sir David. OK, so um, I can see we've had some feedback here um, to to say that um, the Crisis Cafe is run by our partners in Minds are very much still uh, open for business for those uh, in, in crisis. So again, we can send around some information about the Crisis Cafes and the Happy Cafes that David mentioned after today's session. So thanks very much indeed for your uh, questions and for your feedback. We really hope that you found um, this afternoon um, useful. I'm now going to hand over to uh, our chair, Krishni, um, to close today's event. Thanks, Krishni. Thanks, Richard. And uh, can I say a huge thank you to everybody um, who's contributed to today's event. Um, so we had, you know, right back uh, to the beginning, we had uh, presentations from Itai, our medical director, um, Chris Davison, our, um, one of our public governors and acting lead governor, Nathan and Sarah talking about our IAP service, um, and of course, um, David talking about Great Dream and, and uh, giving you a real kind of range of um, really useful information and insight into different things we can all do to manage our mental health and, and access support. Um, I also particularly want to thank Richard for, for moderating and trying to coordinate all the questions because it's quite hard to do that when we're when we're live. Um, and there are an awful lot of people behind the scenes um, who've worked really hard to get this event uh, online um, and hopefully at a time when people found it incredibly useful. Um, and, and that includes um, uh, Chris Davison, our public governor, as I mentioned earlier, Chris has played a, a really key part in helping us to get this event online. So thank you to, to everybody for, for their contributions. And, and certainly looking at the comments in Q&A myself, I think there's been some really positive feedback from people about the tips and um, information they've got. And of course, the feedback from Slido indicating that people um, have perhaps um, got a clearer perspective of how they might wish to uh, or be able to access mental health services, which is really important because I think we need to just remind everybody what Itai and others have said. You know, the most important thing is, you know, mental health is everyone's business. It's all year round. It's not just something that happens at this time of year. We all have um, mental health, mental well-being. Um, and actually looking after that is such a key part of our overall health. Um, so it, it's OK not to be OK. The important thing is to ask for help. Um, and the um, information that's been shared today um, about how you can get help, I think, is really important. David highlighted the IAPT number that um, to access the services that Sarah and Nathan were talking about. Uh, but if in doubt, there's the um, mental health, the integrated, what we call mental health hub, which is a single point of contact, which will navigate you through to the right service. And just to remind you again, the number for that is 0800 448 0828. Um, and, and that number is available 24 seven. You can also go on to NHFT's website and um, and in fact, just search I need help. You'll see that at the top of the uh, web page if you land on our website and that will also take you to a page which outlines the various ways in which you can access help uh, with regard to your mental health. Um, I'd like to just finish by um, just reminding you all that this is, uh, we hope, that the first of a series of events that we'd like to um, uh, offer you this year um, and particularly they are aimed at our members but actually anyone can join and of course anyone can be a member. So I'd really like to encourage people to think about becoming a member of NHFT. 
um, and ask you to um, you know take the opportunity to check it out the, the link is shown on the slide there you've also got a telephone number and an email address but you might be asking yourself well why would I do that well um, I think membership is all about having opportunities to get more information about the services we provide, to influence the way in which services are offered and developed within um, uh, the county, not just within an HFT. It's also an opportunity potentially for involvement. There might be ways in which you can um, engage um, you know, and help us, uh, particularly if you can bring some expertise to bear. So lots of things like that, that, that um, you can use, uh, you know, membership can offer you those benefits. Um, and of course, invitations to um, events such as these, uh, which you will hear first about if you're a member of NHFT. So do take the opportunity to check that out. Um, and also because we have governors like Chris, um, who you've heard from today, who play a really important part in the way that we uh, operate within Northamptonshire. You can actually elect our governors, but also you can stand as a governor um, and be elected yourself and, and take even more of a role. So great opportunities to get more involved with the NHS and particularly with our trust. Uh, through those means and by becoming a member. So please do uh, look into that um, and take that opportunity. So thank you again, everybody for joining. Um, it's been tremendous uh, knowing that so many people have been interested in uh, mental health today uh, and the mental health services are available. Um, and we're delighted that you've taken the time uh, to take part in today's event. We will, as we said, uh, be sharing the uh, recording of this event um, and posting it so that uh, you can point other people to it uh, for more tips and hints and ideas uh, and information about how to access our services. So on behalf of Northamptonshire Healthcare Foundation Trust and on behalf of all the presenters and our partners who contributed to this event, I thank you all for joining us. And I wish you um, uh, a really good rest of today. And, and let's hope uh, we can all look after ourselves uh, really well going forward during this pandemic. Stay safe and thank you.